Hi, my name is Lewis McCaffrey. I'm a research scientist with the Finger Lakes Watershed Hub, part of New York State's Department of Environmental Conservation. My background is in geology and hydrogeology, and as you can tell from my accent, I'm originally from the UK. I'm going to discuss an effort to calibrate a simple model to estimate chlorophyll A in two oligotrophic finger lakes from satellite data using water quality data from my colleagues Amy Klinkhammer and Tony Presta Giacomo. Their methods are discussed elsewhere in this symposium. Why were we interested in doing this study? Well, harmful algal blooms or HABs are being reported more often in New York State and there's a better there's a need for better methods of monitoring HABs over moderately large areas which I define here as being between three acres and 2,000 acres based on image pixel sizes from the ocean sensing satellites. Ponds and most lakes are not well served by ocean sensing satellites whose pixels are too large to resolve small inland water bodies. Eutrophic lakes and blooms like those in Lake Erie and Lake Okeechobee are well studied but Oligotrophic lakes are mostly unstudied, mainly due to very low concentrations of chlorophyll A and accessory pigments like phycocyanin, and therefore a poor signal to noise ratio in remote sensing images. My colleagues carried out an intensive study of two such lakes, shown on the map here, namely Canandaigua Lake in the west of the Finger Lakes and Skinny Atlas Lake in the east. They used statistical techniques to convert fluoroprobe and algae torch profiles to extracted chlorophyll A equivalent values, allowing wide aerial and depth coverage for a low cost. For this study, I chose to focus on data from the two Sentinel-2 satellites, imaginatively named A and B, part of the European Space Agency's Copernicus program. The sensors aboard each satellite provide multispectral data in the visible and infrared parts of the spectrum at 10 meters and 20 meters res spatial resolution respectively. There is a nominal five-day revisit period. Uh, the data is freely available and importantly there are plans to launch replacement satellites called C and D, ensuring the longevity of this record into the future. And I love how in European satellite imagery, it always seems to be cloudy over Britain. I'm sure that's just a coincidence. All satellites are a compromise of technical characteristics like spatial resolution, spectral resolution, return period, and so on. Here I want to contrast the abilities of the two satellite systems to sense chlorophyll A in water bodies. Along the x-axis, we have wavelength from short wavelength are on the left to red and infrared on the right. The solid lines show the relative absorption of light at those wavelengths by chlorophyll A in green and water in blue. Chlorophyll emission by fluorescence is also shown as a dashed line. The box and whisker plots um, show where two different satellite systems can sense. Sentinel-2 data on the top line has fewer bands and quite broad sensitivity. It does sense in useful areas, particularly the difference between blue water and the greenness of algae. And potentially the fluorescence emission of chlorophyll. It does this at 10 meters resolution. Sentinel-3 data on the second line has much more specific sensitivity and double the number of bands, particularly around the chlorophyll emission peak. But the spectral resolution of this sensor ranges from 300 meters to 1200 meters per pixel. Spectral resolution is important because we would love to differentiate between different phytoplankton, namely the green algae and diatoms versus sometimes harmful cyanobacteria. In an ideal world, we could take the, the different spectral signatures of the cyanobacteria and match them to the satellite data. This would be hyperspectral data. But in reality, especially when using Sentinel-2 data, 
we don't have enough spectral resolution to do that. It's rather like trying to work out the color of apples based on a black and white image. Pretty difficult. <clears throat> I've applied a standard quantitative method, uh, empirical method, using historical in situ measurement of water quality parameters. In this case, the concentration of chlorophyll A and phycocyanin with corrected sensor data to produce a similar, uh, sorry, a simple linear regression. The variables in that regression become the model coefficients to be applied to new satellite data, uh, providing estimates of concentration for these water quality parameters. There are certainly significant challenges in using this te technique for monitoring water quality. So for instance, water samples and satellite overflights have to be very close to each other in time. We've produced an overflight calendar for CSLAP volunteers to help with this. And I'm going to talk about CSLAP uh, in a bit more detail in a second. Spatial resolution and spectral resolution of the sensors can't be overlooked, hence the example of the color of apples. There are plenty of confounding interferences like sediment, macrophytes and so on, and visible lake bottoms. It's not possible to tell which species of algae are present and so on, to name just a few. But I, overall, I think that the technique continues to show promise. As I said, there are always complications. In the case of oligotrophic lakes, one is the celebrated clarity of the water. You can see in these two Sentinel-2 images of Skinny Atlas Lake that the bottom of the lake is partly visible. It's hinted at in September, but in April, the bottom is quite apparent. So just how visible is the bottom? Well, we can use other satellites to judge this. Using the space lasers of the ISAT-2 satellite, elevation of both lake surface and lake bottom can be measured. The illustration on the left shows the tracks of the lasers, and the section on the right shows trees on the lake shore, the lake's surface, and the nearshore lake bottom. It is apparent that laser photons can penetrate down to almost 20 meters in Skinny Atlas Lake and make the return journey to the satellite sensor. It's confirmed by the use of Secchi disks to measure water transparency. This depth is proportional to water quality, which of course changes from day to day. And I just love the idea that we can use space lasers. So the phenomenon is uh, it limits the number of locations I could use for calibration of the model. Many sites in Canandaigua and Skinny Atlas lakes had pixels which were dominated by the lake bottom, shown here on the left, for uh, Canandaigua Lake. These were all excluded from the analysis. The limit was around 20 meters uh, depth contour, shown here. This is also the area for which estimates of chlorophyll A are valid in the center of the lake. Let's have a look at the pixels which were used for calibration in this instance again from Canandaigua Lake. The yellow circles in this image are both the sites where chlorophyll A in situ measurements were taken and the location of pixels to be analyzed. In this image you can see the patchy distribution of the bloom with higher concentrations in the east and lower concentrations in the west. We know that these blooms can rise and fall in the water column. Uh, they are pushed around laterally by gentle winds and they can be remixed back into the water column by stronger winds on a time scale ranging from minutes to hours. For this reason, we used only images which were collected within three days of in situ measurement and preferably sooner. Many algorithms exist already for the estimation of water quality parameters from satellite data, and these are just a few. The simplest applies a logarithm to a ratio of the green and blue bands. This effectively measures how green the lake is. It's simple and understandable, but does suffer from interference from sediments and macrophytes and so on. These other 
Uh, algorithms are designed for the highest spectral resolution of ocean sensing satellites with dedicated bands for chlorophyll A. I've tried to adapt them for use in this study with, I think, mixed results. As described by my colleagues Amy and Tony elsewhere in the presentations, they derived concentrations for chlorophyll A and phycocyanin at multiple sites and multiple days and depths at these two oligotrophic lakes, often coinciding with a satellite flyover. In this and subsequent graphs, concentration is along the y-axis and the index derived from satellite imagery is along the x-axis. I won't show all of the data that we have, but in this case, the progression from no detectable phycocyanin in July to around 1.7 micrograms per litre in early September and back again at the end of October is apparent. This is accompanied by an increase in greenness. <clears throat> the ellipses have been added to aid interpretation and have no basis in statistics, by the way. But note, they are elongated along the x-axis showing there is variability in the greenness of the sample pixels, despite phycocyanin being relatively uniform across the lake, with a maximum range of 0 0.5 micrograms per litre. The simple, the simple linear regression has an R squared of around 0 0.7, which is relatively good. A similar plot for chlorophyll A shows a wider range of concentrations um, in each lake for any given day, but still confined to a range of around one microgram per litre. The R squared is lower for chlorophyll A, but the p-values, which I'm not showing here, still gives confidence that this is a real effect. I've plotted both lakes on the same graph here. And for the first time, you can see that we have a group of samples which plot well off the line. These are all from August, and the picture shows what the water looked like on that day. While we don't have microscopic verification, the algae torch we used indicated that this is a diatom bloom. We also have whiting events in the Finger Lakes, which are not well constrained. So this could have interfered with the measurements. I've taken these anomalous points out of the data set for final calibration, but I still have questions about them. I tested modified versions of common indices used with ocean sensing satellites, as I mentioned. The maximum chlorophyll index discriminated between samples below and above 2.5 micrograms per litre, but the regression is relatively poor. The cyanobacteria index is negative when cyanobacteria are present. This confirmed the results of the fluoroprobe and algae torch analyses, but I found it to be less useful for a predictive model. Volunteers have been collecting samples from all of the Finger Lakes since 2017 through the Citizens Statewide Lake Assessment Program, or CSLAP. Here, the 2017 and 18 CSLAP results have been superimposed over the combined Canandaigua and skinny atlas results. They occupy approximately the same space, but the sea slap results have a different trend which needs further investigation. The parameters for the simple linear regression are the ones used in the predictive model. For those of you with a GIS uh, background, here is the geoprocessing model in ArcGIS model builder notation. It extracts the lake areas from the green and blue satellite rasters, ratios them, and then uses an automated scene classification layer to mask out any clouds or shadows. The parameters derived from the linear regression are then applied to each pixel to arrive at the estimation of, in this case, chlorophyll A. And this process takes about three minutes on a standard laptop. Here are some outputs of the predictive model for satellite data from September 2019 for chlorophyll A. Note the limits of validity based on water clarity. 
Canandaigua Lake shows marked lateral variation with higher values on the eastern side of the lake and lower on the west. For comparison, here is a simulated Sentinel-3 image resampled to the 300 res meter resolution of that system. So what we lay lose in spectral resolution by using Sentinel-2, we gain in spatial resolution. Skinny Atlas Lake just has remarkably low concentration of chlorophyll. In terms of further research, I think verifying the fluoroprobe results using photomicrographs of phytoplankton is a natural step. We have to compare the predicted chlorophyll A products to the actual values measured in the field, which we haven't done yet. Rather than using just the surface concentrations in the top two meters, we could use the values all the way down through the water column to the limit of visibility. The thymetry of these lakes is relatively poorly constrained, so improvements would allow the area of validity to be better estimated. We have an amazing long-term record of 170 or more lakes in New York State with open water extracted chlorophyll A concentrations, including mesotrophic lakes, and that would improve calibration and also give a chance to explore some of the limitations. Finally, I would like to be able to extend this to those lakes in New York State which are suitable, which I estimate to be in the order of several thousand lakes. Here are some references uh, which I used for, and you can use them for further reading. I'd like to thank my colleagues Amy and Tony for their foundational work for this uh, research. Karen Binding for opening my eyes to other remote sensing algorithms although I've, if I've misapplied them, then it is entirely my own fault. Also, these institutions have obtained the data using their satellites, served it up on websites and provided training, namely the European Space Agency, NASA, and the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Organization, USGS, Copernicus Program, National Snow and Ice Data Center, and the San Diego Super, Supercomputer Center. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention and please reach out if you have any comments or questions.